We'll try that again. <laughs> if this is your first time joining us in worship this morning or not, we're so glad that you've chosen to be with us in community in worship. My name is Mary Rubley. I'm the pastor here at Broad Street United Methodist Church of Norwich in the central New York region of our state. I have just a couple of quick announcements before we begin our time of worship. All of these, all this information is in your bulletin, so please take time after service to take a look at it. We'll be having a special charge conference after worship next Sunday, November 21st, in the Fellowship Hall. All church members are invited and welcome to attend, yet this, since this is a charge conference, as church members, you will have voice and not vote. As you may or may not be aware, due to the number of sexual misconduct lawsuits that have been filed against the Boy Scouts of America, they have filed for bankruptcy and have developed a reorganization plan that's being re reviewed in the court. Given uh, Broad Street's relationship over the years with the Boy Scouts, a charge conference must be held to give authorization to our board of trustees, in our case, the voting members of our leadership board, to complete the ballot that the Boy Scouts have provided us and have the opportunity to vote on this bankruptcy plan. The purpose of this conference is to give the trustees the authority to review the recommendation of our United Methodist lawyers in conjunction with our Upper New York Conference leadership and the Council of Bishops as to whether or not to approve the Boy Scouts plan of reorganization and to vote on that plan on behalf of our church. Let's please keep all those affected by these lawsuits in our prayers as they continue this painful journey. If anyone has any questions regarding the special charge conference, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd like to call your attention also to the back page of our bulletin where there's information about purchasing wreaths and or poinsettias during this Advent season. Proceeds from this will be going to The Place, which is a community-based youth service here in Norwich, which focuses on empowering children within Chenango County. Okay, technology, love it when it works, don't love it when it doesn't. And right now it's not cooperating. Okay. Plan B. Okay. Um, several of the ministries within our community of faith, as well as here within the Norwich community, our need of additional volunteers, please do prayerfully consider how you may uh, be of help using your hands and feet for Christ. Uh, let's see, I think, that's, I think that's about it as far as announcements. Um, so let's take a moment and prepare ourselves for our time of worship in community this morning. If necessary, take a deep breath and as you exhale, try to let go of all those things that might be preoccupying your mind this time of year as we begin to think about Thanksgiving and Christmas and all of the festivities and activities. Let go of that list, at least for this next hour of worship in which we join together as a community of faith being present for our God who is always present with us.
In this morning's first scripture passage, Psalm 16, in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament portion of our Bible, the writer of this psalm trusts and relies on God's protection. And as a result, the psalmist provides a reminder to each of us of the sense of calm, joy, and gratitude for those of us who remain faithful in our relationship with God. By contrast, the psalmist's quality of serene trust and glad reliance differs sharply from the unnerving imagery presented in our second scripture passage in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, in which Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and the apocalyptic signs of the end of the world. Jesus emphatically advises his disciples not to get caught up in declarations about the end of the world and points out that even though there will be difficult and sometimes horrible times within our lives, that our life will go on and the world will carry on. In other words, it's how we live our lives here and now that matters and not what might happen at some unknown future time. So this morning as we join together in worship on this 25th Sunday after Pentecost as disciples of Jesus Christ, living here and now in the 21st century, let's ask ourselves, when and where have we experienced families, neighborhoods, and or our community of faith endure against doubt or fear? How has our faith sustained us through those difficult times? And finally, who are the folks in each of our lives over this next week that we can encourage and support that are having a difficult time right now? Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Everlasting and ever-present God, too often we settle for the way things are, We embrace what's comfortable and disengage from the work of necessary change. We fail to hope for a new day and a new world because our present reality feels good enough. O God, during this time of worship, open us individually and as a community of faith to your living word and your way. Clear our minds of the daily distractions. Fill our hearts with the humility we need to hear and receive the message you intend for us this day. And when we leave our time of worship in community, fill us with the passion to live and work towards a world made just, equitable, and new. We lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please respond as in the bulletin. Let us come together and worship all who keep watch for our Lord. We await the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet no one knows either the day or the hour of that return except God. Then we must always be alert so we are not found lacking on that day. Let our voices lift our praise as we gather together in worship in this house of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our opening hymn is Stand By Me, the first and third verses in the hymnal, page 512.
Okay. I think it's going to be one of those days. I need to change the batteries in between here. So, as we began a couple of weeks ago during worship, we've been highlighting some of our ministries and sharing where we've witnessed God's presence in our lives and or have been blessed to witness God working in the lives of others. This morning, we're going to provide an opportunity for folks to share some of their God sightings. As this is our first Sunday in which we're focusing more on God sightings, I'll start off by lifting a couple of God sightings that I've been a part of over this last week or so. I've been blessed to witness the care that's been given to not only our, the members of our community of faith, yet those in our wider community of Norwich, as we opened our fellowship hall to the county health department to conduct a COVID vaccination clinic. And prior to this clinic, Tricia, our church administrator, reached out to folks within our community of faith who were eligible to receive their COVID booster and worked with each of them to sign them up for an appointment at this vaccination clinic. I've also been blessed to witness the children's home staff that are upstairs during the week in our church offer a cabinet to us to be used to store the food for the blue food cupboard outside our west entrance of the church. So you see, God sightings aren't, don't have to be some spectacular large things. God sightings can just be the care that we've seen extended to our folks and to those around us. Are there other God sightings that we'd like to lift this morning? I know it's new. Oh. I have a birthday this week on the 20th, and I'm going to be 56 years old. Well, happy birthday, Joel. That is a God sighting and a blessing to many of us. Are there other God sightings that we'd like to... Oh, hi, Sharon. I don't know if it's a God sighting or just a real nice joy, but I received a check from Gilligan's Island this week for $363. Wow. So last Monday was a success. Thank you for everybody who participated. That's, that's a wonderful God sighting. I know that the, the money that's been raised is going to help us with our um, roof and steeple repairs that need to take place. So we had a really good um, event yesterday with the peanut butter, jelly, and clothing um, giveaway. And one thing that came clear, we need to have blankets. So if, as you're going through your home and you find extra uh, blankets, that would be good. We need still all kinds of winter clothing, and in particular, baby or children's clothing, anywhere from newborn on up. So um, thank you so, so much for everything that people are doing. It's truly appreciated. Any others? I'd also like us to um, share any joys or concerns that we might have um, with our community of faith so that we can lift uh, these uh, concerns up or, and even our joys up to our God. Um, just a quick reminder, though, um, unless the person that you're speaking about has given you permission to share information, please just share their name. Um, God does know what the issue is, and we just need to surround them and continue to lift them in prayer. Are there um, particular joys or concerns which we would like to share this morning? Okay, I don't see any. Um, 
For those that are worshiping with us this morning on YouTube, please remember that you're also able to share your joys and concerns with us by either calling the church office um, and leaving a, a message if, if Trisha's not there, or you're welcome to email the church office as well. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Holy and ever-present God, the stress and strain of these days weigh heavy. As we move further into autumn and as the days grow shorter, we're in more need of the hope that only you can provide. Set our eyes to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Remind us of the more of this universe plotted and patterned by your creative hand. Be with us in the small struggles as well as those that threaten to overwhelm us. Transform us so that we can be transformational in love and service to you and our neighbor. Creator God, you are our refuge, our comfort, and our strength in times of disaster, crisis, or chaos. Surround those who are suffering with your grace and peace. May those devastated by fires, storms, or floods find the strength they need to rebuild. May neighbors turn to help neighbors in need, and may we each be one another's hope and help. Lord, we lift to you this morning for strength and healing for Janet Predmore and her medical team as they care for Janet at our local hospital. For Janet's daughter Sharon's mother-in-law, Claudia. For Nicole and her newborn baby. Lord, we're thankful and overjoyed once again for the folks who spent their time and our resources to prepare peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for yesterday's P&J outreach and clothing. Lord, lover of justice, you call us to support the poor and the oppressed. By the power of your Holy Spirit, make us advocates and activists for your justice and instruments of your peace. Help us seek reconciliation through your beloved community, inspired by Jesus Christ's reconciling ministry among us. Empower us to work for what's good, fair, and just. Compassionate God, look upon us with mercy and grace. Free our minds from prejudice and our preferences for violence over peace. Grant us the wisdom and humility to seek your way above all worldly ways so that our path may be righteous and true. Guide us, O God, in all things that we do. As a people of faith, we lift these prayers to you, trusting you hear us and receive us. Lord, hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught us by praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would our young people like to come down, please? Aaron, can you use the hand sanitizer and I'll give you something to hand out? Good morning. Aaron's going to hand something out for us. These are fortune cookies, and it's going to tell us what's going to happen, right? You want to open one and look? Can you open them up? Just open. I don't know how easy they are to open. Did you get them? Are they opening, or do you need help?
Okay, can you tell me what's going to happen? To get it out. What's it say? I can't, I didn't hear you. Something awesome. Something up. And what was yours say? Can you read yours? Oh, you're going to let her read it for you. So are these things, are, gonna, are they predicting what's going to happen today? Do you believe them? I mean, they're in here, right, to tell us what's going to happen? We might get a good laugh out of some of them, right? But it's foolish to think that this little piece of paper is going to tell us what's going to happen in the future, right? But it's fun. Now, some people think they can predict the future and what's going to happen. It's, they're really kind of guessing. Now, some things would happen, right? If I just drank a great big glass of water, what can I predict is going to happen? Am I going to have to go to the ladies' room, right? How about if I had a pile of blocks here, can I say that it would tip that? I could hit them and they would fall over. That would be a prediction that would happen, right? Now, how about this coin? And I'm not sure where it's going to go, okay? Can you tell me if it's going to land on heads or tails? Nope. It's a guess, right? We just throw it up and we look and, and then it lands on tails. There's a lot of things in life that people try to guess or predict, like the weatherman. And how often is he right, right? Sometimes you hear people just say that they'll know when Jesus is going to come back. And Jesus told them that nobody but God knows when that will be. We cannot predict it, and it is not ours to know. God holds the future. And Jesus gave a special promise that hard things will happen in our lives, but he is always with us. That is a prediction that is true. And how are we ready? If, how will we be ready if we don't know when he's coming back? To live our lives every day doing the things that God wants us to do. Being his hands and his feet and telling everyone about Jesus and his love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we don't know what the future holds, but we know that you hold the future. We know that you will be safe when we put our faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll go downstairs. Do okay. so you want to grab those off of the pulpit for me? Off the thing? There's a whole bunch of them on there. On the thing. The first scripture is from Psalm 16 in the Common English Bible. Protect me, God, because I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have nothing good. Now as for the holy ones in the land, the magnificent ones that I was so happy about, let their suffering increase because they hurried after a different God. I won't participate in their blood offerings. I won't let their names cross my lips. You, Lord, are my portion, my cup. You control my destiny. The property lines have fallen beautifully for me. Yes, I have a lovely home. I will bless the Lord who advises me. 
Even at night, I am instructed in the depths of my mind. I always put the Lord in front of me. I will not stumble because he is on my right side. That's why my heart celebrates and my mood is joyous. Yes, my whole body will rest in safety because you won't abandon my life to the grave. You won't let your faithful follower see the pit. You teach me the way of life. In your presence is total celebration. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. And from Mark 13, verses 1 through 8, also from the Common English Bible. As Jesus left the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? What sign will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen. But this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. This is the living word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts gathered this day in community be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, for you are our rock and truly our salvation. Amen. Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famine in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. This morning, believe it or not, we're approaching the end of another church year. Next Sunday, the reign of Christ the King is the last Sunday in our church liturgical year. After that, we begin once again a new church year with the season of Advent. And the scripture passages in the Revised Common lecture, Lectionary for this time in the church year are about the end times. Our second scripture passage in the beginning of the 13th chapter in the Gospel of Mark uses apocalyptic language. In other words, symbolic images and language about the expectation of the end of the world. Webster's Dictionary defines apocalyptic as an imminent cosmic cataclysm in which God destroys the ruling powers of evil. I don't know about you, Yet for me, just the definition of apocalyptic causes me a bit of anxiety. Apocalyptic writings tend to surface, especially when folks are in desperate situations, in times of persecution, when their faith is under attack, or in danger of being abandoned for the sake of safety. 
Throughout human history, there have always been times when folks were afraid and wondered if life on the planet as they knew it would survive. In Jesus' time, the people of Israel and many other countries were under the domination of the Roman Empire, and things were difficult for all those that were not Roman. When the Roman Empire fell, folks who also wondered if it was a sign that the world would end, even as the hordes of other barbarian armies swept throughout Europe. Wars, plagues, famines have affected people the world over throughout the centuries. And people living during these horrendous events wondered if and how they'd survive. And if these events were God's judgment. It can be difficult and confusing for us to read or hear these verses in the Gospel of Mark and to try and figure out what they mean and how they apply to our own lives and times here and now in the 21st century. In our own time, there are still memories of the great war, world wars, the Holocaust, the atomic bomb, and who doesn't remember the Y2K, year 2000 fear, that in, in some cases drove folks uh, to become survivalists, living off the grid, if you will. And in our most recent memories as a society, the COVID pandemic has brought countless deaths, division, and economic struggle. We find ourselves living in a constant state of fear and anxiety for the safety of our children and grandchildren, wondering what the future holds for them. And there are times in which we wonder where God is in all of this. For some folks, the events of our own time are suggesting to them that the end of the world will soon be at hand. They believe that the apocalyptic passages within the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, are roadmaps for the end of the world. And they spend a lot of time trying to match current events with the images and the prophecies contained in those particular verses of Scripture. Over the years, many folks, including Jesus' first disciples, have tried to pin down Scripture passages such as the one we heard this morning in the Gospel of Mark, to a particular date, a particular time. I don't know about you, yet I can certainly sympathize with those who look for hard and fast answers, especially during those times when things te seem to be so out of control, so awful, that no other resolution is possible other than the end of the world as we know it. These feelings come out of fear and grief over some of the realities of our lives. We feel stuck and hopeless, and we can't see any way out. In other words, no way to fix the problem, whatever problem that is. Over this last week, as I was praying and discerning what message God wanted to proclaim through me, I found myself wondering if perhaps you, like I, can't help but think of what we've experienced, what we've been through over these last few years. For example, this beautiful church, and in particular this church sanctuary, where some of us have gathered this morning, stood empty for what seemed to be to us an eternity. Our organ remained silent. Cobwebs probably started to gather under the pews and other places, and the voices that we were accustomed to hearing began to fade from our memories. Each and every one of these things we took for granted prior to, to the COVID pandemic. Maybe, just maybe, it took something of this magnitude for each of us to begin to get very, a very small glimpse of not only the struggle, yet also the promise waiting on the other side of what Jesus is telling each of us this morning. 
Over these last months that have seemed to never end, I found myself grateful to have experienced the deep certainty that the bricks and the mortar of our church building could stand empty. And yes, God forbid, perhaps even be destroyed. Yet the faith that we hold, and which holds us, would endure. Because the faith we hold did endure. The faith we hold does endure. And the faith we hold will continue to endure. Yet even though I know this is in every fiber of my being, I also know that there are those who've had to endure so much more. For example, I think of all the nurses and the doctors and the EMTs who have witnessed far too much death in this season of COVID. Even as I pray for them daily, I can't imagine all that they've lost and the post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, that each of them are carrying and will continue to carry far longer than the pandemic that has caused it. I also find myself wonder, pondering what life over these many months has been for those who prior to the pandemic were compromised. Those who find themselves homeless and those who go without a meal on a regular basis. I wonder if over these last months you and I may have been given more understanding that we couldn't have had before. If only in and through the really very limited ways our lives have been impacted due to COVID. I wonder if by allowing ourselves to go a bit, a bit deeper into what has happened to us, if, it might come, if we might come away with a deeper empathy in us for the conditions in which our neighbors are living that aren't in any way reflective of what God intends. And I wonder if now we might be able to recognize our neighbors, to stand still as best we can in, in the experience they hold, which is so very different than ours, and to begin to maybe build a relationship with them and hopefully be able to call them by name. And so I ponder, if maybe, just maybe, if all of this might help us hear these living words of Scripture in the Gospel of Mark this morning, and not only words of terror, yet also words of promise, as words of hope, even as we begin to experience those things we've always taken for granted that may be crumbling around us. Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. The one thing about apocalyptic writings throughout the Bible is that there's always hope. Apop apocalyptic scripture passages were written to help us keep our eyes focused on God and God's actions throughout human history, and to give us assurance that despite appearances to the contrary, God is still God. God still reigns. And ultimately, the past, the present, and the future belong to God. The disciples ask Jesus when this will happen, and Jesus answers them by not answering them. Instead, he tells them over 2,000 years ago, as well as each of us here and now, to be faithful, not fearful, to set our minds on trusting and being aware rather than worrying about a calendar. Jesus' words are meant to put an end to any speculation about when the end of time as we know it will happen. Jesus says, don't worry about knowing when. That's not ours to know. Yet there are things that we can know. For example, God is at work. 
bringing everything to completion according to God's purposes and plans. And God doesn't willingly cause the suffering of any of God's creation. And it grieves the God who made us with the capacity for grief when anyone suffers and or when anyone causes suffering for themselves or another. As United Methodists, we know that Scripture is our primary source of knowledge, along with tradition and experience and reason for knowing who God is, what promises God has made, how God works, what faithfulness looks like, especially as we know God in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is urging his disciples not to be led astray by false messiahs. He's reminding us to cling to what we know about him. We won't be deceived and we'll have reason for hope if we know the scriptures, if we use the scriptures as a lens through which to view the world and how we make our way in the world. Jesus told his disciples, neither he nor we know when the kingdom of God will arrive, neither the day nor the hour. Jesus is reminding his disciples that our times, our past, our present, our future are in God's hands. And it's not God's control, and it's not that God controls every action, as if there's no such thing as human choice or free will. Yet instead that God will work God's purposes out within human history, within time and space, on this earth, until God brings about the new heavens and the new earth. As this church year winds down, as we move into the darkest time of the calendar year, we also turn once again to the anticipation the season of Advent and all that it foretells. We turn once again to hope in the light of the world, the hope of our redemption and the promise of God's kingdom. So much of life today, here and now, in the 21st century, seems to be driven by fear. For example, we wonder when the next climate disaster will strike. Where will the next pandemic emerge? How long will our economic security last? Both of this morning's scripture passages remind us of the one who listens to our fears and transforms the seeming bleakness of our futures and who both reminds and challenges each of us to the life that God is offering to each and every one of us. With all that's going on in the world, fear can feel like our constant companion some days, can it? And similar to the folks in the writer of the Gospel of Mark's community, we're troubled by the way of life that are crumbling before our eyes. Our faith in national and global institutions are somewhat waning. Yet as faithful, faith-filled followers of Jesus Christ, we're called not to follow the greatness of this world, yet to rely on God's truth and God's promises to us. After all, haven't we seen time and time again throughout human history that God has given us the blueprints to deal with global pandemic, the climate crisis, and urgent calls for racial justice. The blueprint that God has given each of us is to care for others, to treat everyone fairly, and to advocate and demand justice for the marginalized. Given this, I wonder what structures in our world here and now in the 21st century might need to be rebuilt so that everyone might live in the fullness of God. I believe that God's giving us individually and as a community of faith 
opportunities to encourage one another in faith and hope, to see God's faithful presence and kingdom within our midst, and to be activists to help make the world reflect the kingdom of God here on earth. Believe me, I recognize with all that's going on within our world right now, right now, let alone our particular community, that the simplest thing for us to do would be to give in to those fears which news agencies and various forms of social media and politicians keep drumming into our ears and our minds and our hearts. Yet do we understand do we truly comprehend that the more difficult task for us as followers, as disciples of Jesus, is to trust, to hold on to God's promises, and to see life beyond the walls of worry that we and others have built up around us? For you see, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of upheaval or turmoil, rebirth, and hope are the ways of our God. So over this next week, I'm asking each of us to prayerfully consider or ponder, how might we challenge those folks who are constantly promoting fear and worry? What words of hope might we offer to them? And in what ways might we individually and as the church Encourage each other in hope. What stories might we share of this faith and of hope? Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Everlasting and ever-present God, help us to discern and hold fast to your presence in the midst of an ever-changing circumstance that we individually and as a community of faith may live with hope love, and courage at all times and in all ways. May it be so today and forever. Amen. For those that are worshiping this morning here in our church sanctuary, there's an offering plate in the back of the sanctuary to receive your tithe at the end of worship. And we ask those that are joining us remotely via YouTube to prayerfully consider joining us in our various ministries here locally, nationally, and internationally by sending in your tithe into our church office. God is the maker and provider for all. And God has blessed us with many gifts. We're thankful for the opportunity to share our resources of time, talent, tithe, and labor to strengthen God's work throughout the world. May we offer God these gifts along with our commitment to change the world as God would have us do. Let's give joyfully and let's worship as we give.
For those that are able, please join me in our prayer of dedication, which is found in your bulletin. Today, O oh Lord, we offer you our sacrifice of time, energy, and love, knowing full well they are mere tokens of the awe-inspiring faith you stir within each of us. Accept these gifts and our lives, that they may continue the good work in Christ, in our church, in our community, and in the world. Amen. Please join me in our closing song this morning, O Day of God, Draw Nigh, number 730 in our United Methodist Timbernal, and we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5. May we each leave our time of worship and community this day experiencing the extravagant and unconditional love of our God, the selfless care of our Lord and risen Savior Jesus Christ. And may each of us continue to be nurtured and sustained by the Holy Spirit as we go forth sharing the hope and the promises that God has made. Amen. Mm -hmm.